Greetings Guardians, my name is Bife here. So, we've talked a lot about the Vex on this channel in the past, and I've tried to persistently talk about their capabilities where possible. Despite this, there are undoubtedly players out there who don't get the terrifying reality of what is truly within the possible clutches of the Vex, the power that they really wield. This is definitely due to a lack of understanding, and it leads to the Vex just being reduced to a bunch of alien robots made of brass in some people's minds. But of course, that's for starters not a completely accurate description of them in the first place, and more importantly, it hides the true extent of the horror that they're capable of inflicting. I wanted to talk about one method by which that horror manifests today. One of the most mind-bending things that the Vex can possibly do to any individual or any group, and that is to fully and perfectly simulate them. Now. I should be really clear, these risks are not immediately posed to Guardians, horrifying though they may be, and to some of you, that might not sound too horrifying at all at first. But conceptually, when you wrap your head around what's happening in that moment, you start to realise how bad it can get. To give you a more understandable analogy to this, has anyone played The Sims? If you have, you may have played the game successfully and done a whole bunch with it, but there's also potentially the reality that you could have just done it with a somewhat more comedic intent in mind. Has anyone ever had the Grim Reaper play rock, paper, scissors with a sim? Have you ever had a pool and then just removed the way to get out of it using the ladder? Have you ever trapped them in a corner and thus prevented them from escaping? Yeah, this is the real problem, because in this instance, the sims are us. So, first things first, let's get something straight. I said near the beginning that Guardians were probably exempt from this horrifying trick, and that at current remains true, but I don't want to state that it'll remain that way forever. At the moment, the Vex aren't able to carry out this particular trick on Guardians because it relies on the ability to simulate the individual accurately. For the longest time, the Vex have struggled to properly implement this against Guardians because we are paracausal in nature, the Vex are able to perfectly simulate things according to the laws and mathematics of the universe by the use of inference, and in other words, they basically guess with incredible accuracy what's going to happen next, based on the actual mechanics and physics of the universe itself. The Guardians present a problem with that because on a regular basis, our powers are outside of the bounds of the laws of physics. They cannot be simulated because they can't be calculated. So I mean the Vex will still try, but they'll have one hell of an uphill battle. To give you an idea, it might be a little bit like trying to chase a Ferrari down an open road when you're using a bulldozer with a top speed of about 5 miles an hour. Sure, the bulldozer is really powerful, and when it catches up to the Ferrari, it'll absolutely demolish it. But that's the problem. The chances of it actually catching up are next to zero. That being said, the Vex have been trying to simulate light, guardians, and other paracausal forces or entities for a very long time. They have had some limited success, and should they attain wider success in the future, we might also have to face this terrifying Vex trick, which is all really going to be boiled down to that very simple question. If a Vex is playing God, do you know that the world around you is really real? Let's unpack that a little bit more, because at the heart of this entire idea that the Vex can play God and build a perfect simulated copy of us, there is the base question at the heart of all of it which is one of perspective. How do you know that anything you're experiencing right now as you're listening or watching this video is real? You might reply to that question with the fact that you can experience or interact with the world around you using your senses, and therefore you know it's real. You can touch your phone that you're watching this on right now. You can hear the words that I'm speaking into your ears. But here's the thing. What if I told you that all those things you're sensing, be it through sight, sound, touch, smell, taste, pressure, or any other sense that you have, could actually just be a result of a Vex simulation? Because if the simulation is perfect, it will be able to simulate all those things as well. This is where the Vex show us their terrifying power, and this is where we need to unpack things more. The philosophical problem of asking how much of the world we actually know to be real in front of us isn't exactly new. I'm sure at least a few of you have seen art that explores this particular topic, or movies such as The Matrix or Inception, but it goes back even further. 
When examining the base factors of reality in Destiny, I think our measuring stick with the Vex still thankfully adheres to a simple constant. That in some form or another, even if everything we are experiencing is just a Vex simulation, it does mean that we still exist, albeit not in the form that we currently perceive. If anyone's ever heard of the old phrase, I think therefore I am? Yeah, that's pretty relevant here. When René Descartes said those words, he was touching on a similar idea to this. Even if there's a force manipulating your perception, like say, a Vex simulation, you're still thinking and perceiving that simulation, which means that at base, you still exist. You must be real, even if you are just a part of that simulation. Sadly for us, this isn't so much a comforting fact that we do indeed exist within the vast metaphysical plane of the universe, and it's more of a damning fact, because if we find ourselves inside of X simulation, and we realize that it is being simulated, we need to accept a terrifying truth. The Vex is in control of everything, and with that in mind, we're almost certainly doomed. They can play God. So all this talk of being inside of Vex simulation is fairly pie in the sky right now, right? I mean, what's the point of talking about Vex simulations in the first place if there aren't any practical examples of this stuff actually happening? No one's gotten trapped inside a Vex simulation, have they? Well, yeah, they have actually. This is one of the original stories from Destiny 1 to do with the Vex, and it's the story that is going to probably be retold at some point soon in Destiny, the story of the original Ishtar Collective science team on Venus. Going all the way back to the grimoire cards of Destiny 1, we have the entries for the Vex. More specifically, the grimoire cards titled Ghost Fragment Vex 1 through 4. This tells us the story of the Ishtar Collective research team on Venus that was responsible for studying the Vex ruins in the Ishtar Sink, namely around the Vault of Glass, Citadel, Endless Steps, and a few other research sites. We're going to dive into their story, and to understand the background of it, you need to understand that this research team consisting of Maya Sundaresh, Chioma Essi, Duane McNeed, and Dr. Shim were all studying a Vex unit of some kind. This Vex unit is referred to only as Specimen 12, and you could actually acquire Specimen 12 in Destiny 1 as a hunter artifact which had the following image associated with it. During their study, Specimen 12 started doing exactly what we've just discussed. The Ishtar Collective team realized that this Vex unit was perfectly simulating them, all four of them. And it wasn't just one simulation, it was hundreds. I'm going to read through the full story so that you have context. For those of you wondering who is speaking at any one time, if you are a listener, do note that I'm going to be referring to anything that is on screen. There are four different speakers throughout this story, and I'll do my best to intonate, but those are the four scientists. Chioma Essi, Maya Sundaresh, Dwayne McNeed, and Dr. Shim. Maya, I need your help. I don't know how to fix this. What is it, Chioma? Sit. Tell me. I figured out what's happening inside the specimen. Twelve? The operational VEX platform. That's incredible. You must know what this means. Ah, so it's not good, or you'd be on my side of the desk. And it's not urgent, or you'd already have evacuated the site. Which means I have a working interface with the specimen's internal environment. I can see what it's thinking. In metaphorical terms, of course. The cognitive architectures are so... No. I don't need any kind of epistemology bridge. Are you telling me it's human? A human Merkveld? A human Qualia? I'm telling you, it's full of humans. It's thinking about us. About... Oh, no. It's simulating us. Vividly. Elaborately. It's running a spectacularly high-fidelity model of a collective research team studying a captive Vex entity. How deep does it go? Right now, the simulated Maya Sundaresh is meeting with the simulated Shoma Essi to discuss an unexpected problem. There's no divergence. That's impossible. It doesn't have enough information. It inferred. 
It works from what it sees, and it infers the rest. I know that feels unlikely, but it obviously has capabilities we don't. It may have breached our shared virtual workspace, but the neural links could have given it data. The simulations have interiority. Subjectivity? I can't know that until I look more closely, but they act like us. We're inside it. By any reasonable philosophical standard, we are inside that vex. Unless you take a particularly ruthless approach to the problem of causal forks, yes, they are us. Call a team meeting. The other you has too. So there is a lot of techno babble here in this first part that's being brought up. At the end of the day, the important thing to recognize is this. By looking at the architecture of the Vex, normally you would need some kind of bridge so you could understand and interpret the thoughts of the Vex, because they're not like the thoughts of the human. But in this instance, when Shioma Essi looked into the Vex, she found that it was perfectly simulating the entire Ishtar Collective team that was studying it. The structures were near perfect, and where it was missing information, it had mathematically inferred the rest. That last bit that Maya Sundaresh points out, about how all reasonable philosophical standards point to them being inside the Vex, is what's expanded upon next. So that's the situation as best we know it. To the best of my understanding. Well, I'll be a f***ing shit. This is extremely f***ed. That thing has us over a barrel. Yeah, we're in a difficult position. I don't understand. So it's simulating us. It made virtual copies of us. How does that give it power? It controls the simulation. It can hurt our simulated selves. We wouldn't feel that pain, but rationally speaking, we have to treat an identical copy's agony as identical to our own. It's God in there. It can simulate our torment forever. If we don't let it go, it'll put us through hell. We have no causal connection to the mind state of those sims. They aren't us, just copies. We have no obligation to them. You can't seriously... Your own self, you idiot. Think, think. If it can run one simulation, maybe it can run more than one. And there will only ever be one reality. Play the odds. Oh. Uh-oh. Odds are that we aren't our own originals. Odds are that we exist in one of the Vex simulations right now. I didn't think of that. In this moment, Dr. Shim has put two and two together and has realized that because the simulations are perfect copies of reality, and because there's potentially more than one, there will only ever be one copy of reality, and therefore, if you play the odds, the likelihood is that they are actually in the simulation. Again, let's say there are only five simulations and they're all identical, and you know that one of them is real. That's an 80% chance of you just being a simulated copy. But of course, it's much worse than that. As it turns out, and as we'll reveal later, there wasn't just five or even one copies of the simulation. There were 227 simulations of these scientists going on. That's 228 versions of reality, all happening at once, all perfectly copying the base copy, the original reality. The Vex had control of all of those 227 simulations. Those simulations were authentic, but they seemed very much real. That means that for all but one of those sets of scientists, the danger of the Vex being able to erase them or inflict severe trauma of some kind upon them is not only possible, but likely. They would have to sit and realize that they are trapped within a Vex, in a world of its own making where it controls the laws. And whenever possible, whenever it needs to, it could simply flip a switch, change the currents of the world around them, and turn their reality into a living hell. The conversation of the Ishtar Collective team continues as they try to think of a way out of their predicament. I have a plan. If you have a plan, then so does your sim, and the Vex knows about it. Does it matter? If we're in hell right now, 
There's nothing Stop we can talking about real and unreal. All realities are programs executing laws. Subjectivity is all that matters. We have to act as if we're in the real universe, not one simulated by the specimen. Otherwise, we might as well give up. Your sim self is saying the same thing. Show my love, please. Hush. It doesn't help. Maybe the simulations are just billboards. Maybe they don't have interiority. It's bluffing. I wish someone would simulate you shutting up. If we're sims, we exist in the pocket of the universe that the Vex specimen is able to simulate with its onboard brain power. If we're real, we need to get outside that bubble. We call for help. That's right. We bring in someone smarter than the specimen. Someone too big to simulate and predict. A war mind. In the real world, the war mind will be able to behave in ways the Vex can't simulate. It's too smart. The war mind may be able to get into the Vex and rescue us. If we try, won't the Vex torture us for eternity? Or just erase us? It may simply erase us. But I feel that's preferable to the alternatives. I agree. Once we make the call, the Vex may react. So let's all savor this last moment of stability. You two are adorable. I wish I'd taken the job at Clovis Bray. I'm pretty sure that the indistinct sounds at the very end there were meant to represent the partners, Shoma and Maya, embracing in a kiss. I mean, it only makes sense. If this is their last moment of supposed stability before being wiped out by a Vex, yeah, what else are you gonna do? It's your last moment alive before you potentially die, and your lover is right there next to you. I wouldn't give a damn. I'm sure most people wouldn't. Not to mention, Dwayne and Shim's reactions sort of spell it out. Regardless, Maya's plan worked. Thanks to assistance from Rasputin in the Golden Age, the simulated copies of the scientists were extracted from Specimen 12. As it turned out, there were 227 simulated copies of the four scientists. 227. That's 908 copies of perfectly simulated human beings. Pretty remarkable when you add things up. Each of them was thinking the exact same thoughts as the original real scientists, and each of them had the same plan. Having been rescued, the simulated copies now needed to face the fact that they weren't real, and that they couldn't continue living the lives they'd known. But with that change of circumstance came an opportunity. An opportunity to explore the Vex network. So, unanimously it seems, they took that chance. Up here, they have to act by biomechanical proxy. No human being in the Ishtar Academy has ever crossed the safety cordon and walked the ancient stone under the citadel. The Vex construct that stabs up out of the world to injure space and time. It's not safe. The cellular Vex elements are infectious, hallucinogenic, entheogenic. The informational Vex elements are more dangerous yet. And there could be semiotic hazards beyond them, aggressive ideas, Vex who exist without a substrate. Even now, operating remote bodies by neural link, the team's thoughts are relayed through the war mind who saved them, sandboxed and scrubbed for hazards. Their real bodies are safe in the academy, protected by distance and neural firewall. But they walk together, in proxy, pressed close, huddled in awe, blue-green light, Light, the color of an ancient sea, washes over them. Each of their explorer bodies carries a slim computer. Inside, 227 copies of their own minds wait, patient and paused for dispersal. I wonder where it came from, Dwayne McNeed says. Of course, he's the one that breaks the reverent silence. The Citadel. I wonder if it was here before the Traveler changed to Venus. It could have been latent, Gemma Essie suggests. She's the leader. She kept them together when it seemed like they faced actual, eternal torture. She pulled them through. Seated in the crust, waiting for a period of geological quiescence so it could grow. Dr. Shim shrugs. I think the Traveler did something paracausal to Venus, 
something that cut across space and time. The Citadel seems to come from the past of a different Venus than our own. It doesn't have to make any sense by our logic any more than the moon's new gravity. Maya Sundaresh walks at the center of the group. She's been too quiet lately. What happened to them wasn't her fault, and maybe she'll believe that soon. What could you do with it? She murmurs, staring up. If you understood it. Chioma puts an arm around her. That's what we're going to find out. Where the Citadel can send us. Whether we can come back. They're not us anymore. Maya looks down at herself, at the cache of her self forks. We're not going anywhere. We're sending them. They're diverging. They rescued themselves from inside a Vex mind. 227 copies of themselves, untortured and undamaged. Those copies voted, all unanimously, to be dispatched into the Vex information network as explorers. When Maya and Shioma look at each other, they can tell they're each wondering the same thing. How many of them will stay together, wherever they go? How many Fork Mayas and Fork Chiomas will fall out of love? How many will end up bereft, grieving? How many will be happy, like them? Chioma tries a little smile. Maya smiles back, haltingly and then, sighing, unable to stop herself, grins a big stupid grin. An everything is okay grin. Shim makes a loud obnoxious "oh" at them. Dwayne McNeed is still thinking about paracausality and doesn't notice. They climb. When they find the Vex aperture they plan to use, they overlay the luminous stone and ancient brassy machines with images of sun and sand. They set up the transmitters and interfaces that will translate 227 simulations of the four of them into Vex language, into the tangled pathways of the Vex network, to see what's out there and maybe come home. In the metaphor they've chosen, setting up the equipment is like laying out the picnic. In the metaphor they've chosen, they look like themselves, not hardened explorer proxies. Like people. Do you think, Dwayne McNeed begins, halting, that you could use this place to change things? If you regretted something, could you find a way through the Citadel, go back and change it? I wish I could go back and change you into someone else, Dr. Shim grouses. Chioma's shaking her head. She knows physics. Time is self-consistent, she says. I think it's like the story of the merchant and the alchemist. You could go back and watch something or be part of something, but if you did, then that was the way it always happened. Maybe you could bring something back to now. Something you needed. Maya runs a hand across the surface of the Vex aperture, feeling it with sensors 10,000 times as precise as a human hand. These proxy bodies are limited. They crash and need resetting every few hours. They struggle with latency. They can't hold much long-term memory, but they'll get better. Or go forward and learn something vital. If you knew how to control it, how to navigate across space and time. So it's just a way to make everything more complicated, Dwayne McNeed says. It doesn't fix anything. Nothing ever does. I should have taken the job. You would have hated it at Clovis, Dr. Shim says. We both know you're happier here. Dwayne McNeed stands stunned by his courtesy. And then they both pretend to ignore each other. The four of them set up the interface. Their stored copies wake up and prepare for the journey, so that as they work they find themselves surrounded by the mental phantasms of themselves. 227 Mayas and Chiomas knocking helmets and smiling. 227 Dr. Shims making cynical bets with each other about how long they'll last. 227 Dwayne McNeeds blowing goodbye kisses to the sweet golden sun. 227 of them shaking hands, smiling, making ready to explore. 
So, the story of the 227 copies thankfully ends, at least well enough for the real, original human beings there. But the reality is that the simulated nature of the existence of those copies could have resulted in disaster. It was unbelievably fortunate that the Ishtar Collective had the permission and the ability to access the War Mind in order to save those simulated copies. But that won't always be the case, especially now that Rasputin has passed onwards. Unless he is somehow resurrected as a guardian with some measure of his full former capabilities, it is unlikely that we'll ever see such a rescue effort made again. And we just have to understand as well that by the very nature of the Vex, by the very nature of them being able to play God, and by the nature of their simulations being so identical, reality bending destruction is possible from their perspective. And if we were in a simulation, the reality that we would experience would be subject to the Vex's whims, and our death, painful or unpainful as it was, would be just as real. The Vex, in this sense, have a degree of godlike power. The terrifying and truly important question, then, is whether the Vex could expand the scope of these simulations to include the great defenders of the system, the Guardians. There is no easy way to answer that question, but the Sol Divisive has certainly been trying over and over again. And even without the power of darkness or some other paracausal force, the Vex have had limited success in interfacing with paracausal power. Saint-14's light being drained specifically by Agioptis, the Martyr Mind, and even more so and more importantly for our instance, Panoptes, the mind that was capable of predicting a final Vex victory within the Infinite Forest, are both clear examples of the fact that the Vex capabilities are growing. Being aware of this Vex capability will potentially allow us to break free from it in the event that this actually happens to us Guardians, if we're able to break out of the Vex reality, then maybe we are able to escape and discover how to get back to ourselves. If the Vex are able to get to that point though, Traveler help us. We might just all be doomed anyway. Being subject to the whims of anyone who can play God inevitably leaves us in a terrifying position, and we can only hope that the real versions of ourselves are strong enough to step in and save us when the time is right. But that's all from me for now. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope the video was interesting. It's one of the more mind-bending topics of Destiny, and if you did enjoy it, go ahead and leave a like and leave your own thoughts down below. As for how this relates to Echoes, I actually want to try and do a much larger video talking about the potential story beats that will come along in Echoes. Those videos will exist for Echoes, Heresy, and Revenant, and I want to be able to do something more in-depth for each of them. But they'll take time to make, and in the meantime we can cover more interesting topics that aren't necessarily immediately related and might just be interesting things. I know that it's not necessarily going to be everyone's first watch either, but considering that it's something that people have been waiting for me to finish for a very long time, I'm also going to see if I can finish off the Journals of Clovis Bray series. And I'm also going to go back to basics with this. I'm going to go back and complete the beginner's guide to destiny. And one last thing, I know, it's a long laundry list at this point, I don't blame you if I've already clicked off the video, but I am also still working with an artist on the complete story of destiny, all the way up from Origins to Final Shape. That video will be releasing before Final Shape, and it's months out, but I want to remind you all again that it is on the way. That being said, thank you very much for watching and know that as always, your viewership is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Rodasia Adastra. I'll see you, Starside. <laughs>